wonderful place, a wonderful occasion. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, all the organizers. Uh, I, you know, now I have this. Uh, uh, how much actually, Nicola? One hour for 50 yeah, minutes, hour. something like that. So, and I will try to walk you to. You know, this is the title: Data Computation and Contagion Processes. Nicola told uh, I, I'm a physicist. Uh, actually, I was a physicist many years ago. Then I spent, uh, you know, 10 years in a computer science department, and now it's almost 10 years that I that I work in public health uh, in an active way. So, in a sense, you know, I, I I'm not sure I'm a physicist. However, this kind of meetings uh, reminds me a lot of meeting in physics. A lot of places. Uh, and probably Dirk too, you remember, you know, we were meeting in those, uh, in those little uh, uh, places and, and you know, the most wonderful interaction happened in an environment like this one, you know, so I, I, I'm sure that this will be one place where, uh, where something special uh, will, uh, will happen. Uh, obviously I have also to, to do the usual uh, uh, things because what I will present here for uh, in, in the next hour is actually the work of many, many people, and I could have not done this work without them. Most of the work that I will present at this recent work uh, is, uh, is in collaboration uh, uh, with the Center for Inference uh, and Dynamics of Infectious Diseases, that is a large uh, center of excellence of the NIH uh, in the US uh, for uh, modeling of infectious diseases. Uh, uh, and other collaborations uh, with uh, with teams across the United States and Europe, and actually, you know, most of the GLEAM project and, and and the things about epidemiology has been the work of many many people for more than ten years. And uh, Nicola was one of the main actor uh, for many years of this of this project, as well as many many other collaborators. Some of them will be also joining the school in uh, in the next few days, also. Ciro Carturo, Daniela Palotti, and many, many others have been, have been uh, how to say, part of this, uh, of this, uh, of this work. And, and just let me uh, mention uh, that the, uh, recently all the things, uh, some of the things I will, uh, I, I will show you are related to what is called the WHO blueprint. As you probably know, uh, there have been a couple of uh, uh, large, uh, epidemic threat recently. One was Ebola and the other one was Zika. And actually there, those, uh, those threats have, uh, have shown that there is a little bit of hiccups from time to time in the, in the way we react uh, to those kind of emergencies. And so the WHO is trying to, uh, to create a blueprint, uh, a, really a kind of uh, path to respond to those kind of emergencies. And uh, some of the things I will mention are part of the work uh, that, that goes into it. That direction. Well, let me start from uh, a long time ago. Let me start from uh, you know more than uh, in 1766. So this is basically when we date back the uh, the birth of uh, what we call mathematical epidemiology. So the fact that you get uh, you uh, derive a set of equations that describe the evolution of a, of a disease. And one of the classic. Uh, prototypic model for, uh, for infectious disease is what we call the SIR model. So a model in which uh, infectious are uh, susceptible, infectious, uh, if they are becoming con uh, get in contact with infectious uh, uh, individuals, and then move into a remove compartment that could signal the death of the individual or the, uh, the fact that you have uh, uh, recovered and, and you cannot get the disease again. Well, this is the most basic representation of a disease. Obviously, we are forgetting about what happens within the host, all the viral response of the immune system. We are just describing the disease with those tags, those compartmental structure that allows us to identify individuals. And, and obviously, as you can imagine, this is not realistic. Okay, we are not going to use that for any real disease. And uh, you can imagine to enlarge this framework to many, 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 many more kind of possible occurrences uh, and the natural history of a disease. But you know, for this kind of model, many years ago, you know, the basic equation have been uh, have been defined. So, and this is the what you find in textbook on how to describe the evolution of a disease with uh, with uh, with mathematical with mathematical tools. And so, one of the questions that you might wonder is, okay, 
If this is, was almost 300 years ago, what is the state of the art now? Because, you know, we are all used to, to get on, uh, now on a, on a laptop or your mobile phone and get information, for instance, on what will be the weather tomorrow. Nicola was mentioning, you know, tomorrow and after tomorrow it will be very windy, watch out for the waves, etc., etc. That's because, you know, weather forecasts now, we, we know how to, to predict them and, you know, we know many, many things. Actually, weather forecasts were so important that, that at the same time popularized concepts like the butterfly effect, etc., etc. Uh, yeah, you know, these are so, in a sense, they spoiled us in the fact that we can easily access information about the future. You know, my kids over there from time to time, they ask me, you know, well, why don't you ask the uh, internet about that or what will happen tomorrow, you know? And this is not, you know, actually it's not the case. And just let me give you what to this kind of uh, uh, things. And this are, is a column for the numerical weather models, and this is numerical epidemic models. And so you would say, okay, the two things have uh, evolved in parallel. And actually what happens is that in 1920, Richardson in the UK integrate manually the first equation, and we are talking about that, this big mess here, you know, to evaluate the temperature and the barometric pressure in one point of England based on data, and he was using those equations to project of 24 hours those values. The poor guy, you know, worked with this equation, and uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the time where no computers were available. So the guy started to do pen and paper calculations that were lasting for painful months. And at the end, he got a result. And this result, unfortunately, was wrong. But the poor guy was wrong for two reasons. Actually, one is that in doing this big mess of calculations, uh, he did factual uh, arithmetical errors, you know, as you can imagine. And the other thing is that he didn't realize that he went too deep into the equations. And so he was using uh, equations that were too detailed for the kind of calculation he was doing. And so they were fast mode into these waves that were superfluous and giving spurious results. But you know, the guy was a real visionary because he was saying, okay, if I can try to do this by hand, obviously one day somebody will do this kind of forecast. And actually he went to the stage of thinking about a big stadium with 20,000 or 30,000 people, I don't remember, that were uh, in, in different sector of this kind of, uh, of stadium with people connecting them, bringing the results of calculation. He was imagining a human calculator, a human computer. And he was estimating 30,000 people to do in six hours or 10 hours a calculation for the 24 hours forecast. So you see that he was in a way envisioning this process. And actually, in the 1930s, at the same time, Reed Frost defined a simple chain binomial model that integrates an epidemic in a stochastic way. Well, again, these were years in which no computer was available, and so how you integrate uh, a stochastic model? Well, actually, you take uh, urns with red bolts and blue bolts, and then you start to do random extraction, and you do the, the model in, uh, in real life. Okay, so that that's was, you know, in a sense that this was very prototypical uh, uh, first steps in, area, in those areas. In 1930, however, you know, there is the first numerical prediction for a weather forecast. And this is a 24-hour prediction out of a 24-hour calculation on the first digital computer, the ENIAC. Well, let me say, digital, it's completely different from what we mean uh, by digital now. It was, you know, several rooms with a lot of components that were not digital at all. But, you know, it was an utterly useless forecast because it's 24 hours to get what is the, 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 the weather at that very moment. But this is actually the proof of concept. And now you see that in 1955, here, you know, you get that weather forecast become operational at this point uh, and, and get into what is the history. This is the first control room for weather forecast. It seems like, you know, 200 years ago, but actually this is less than 60 years ago. So what happens instead in, uh, in, in uh, epidemics is 1952. First read, uh, for, uh, there is a first read frost numerical implementation. And so you say, oh, well, epidemics are catching up. Well, however, nothing until 
year 2000 in terms of real operational forecasts. And so you say, what happened? Why this gap? You know, and if you think about now, in 2015, you know, you have government and commercial entities that does weather forecasts as a business. You know, it's not just government uh, things. Well, if you think about, uh, you know, what we have now in, in, uh, in, com in, uh, in contagion forecasts, we are just at the beginning. And so the issue is what happened? And the, what happened is the lack of data. You know, we all know that, you know, we have sent satellite in orbits, we have built uh, thousands of weather stations across the world. We have started to accumulate data. Actually, supercomputing uh, is born because we wanted to do weather forecasts. Well, for contagion phenomena, if you think about epidemics, nothing like that is yet in place. And actually, this is for most of the things that are concer concerned with this school, social phenomena. Social phenomena data gathering on a large scale starts basically 10 years ago when we start, when we start talking about the big, data, the big data era, okay? So, and now there is all the hype about big data. So every you know, year we get, we produce more socioeconomic data than in the entire human, uh, human history. And, uh, and obviously we have these data which are unstructured, which are full of trash, etc., etc. how to work, and this is what we are doing here. This is why we have this week now. But obviously this has created a change of, uh, a shift of gear in most of social uh, uh, driven phenomena, like for instance epidemics, so that we can start thinking about forecasts, we can think about uh, data-driven models. And this is because of the many data that we can actually gather. Obviously, when we talk about big data, the first thing that we think is just the pure digitalization of things. So most of you are very, very young, and so you probably don't remember, but when you were taking an airplane like you did uh, to be here in Sardinia, you had to go to an agent. Uh, this agent was calling the airline company and was filling uh, a booklet of paper slip thick as that in multiple copies by hand and then you were going with this booklet you know at the check-in desk where the lady still manually operating was you know tearing apart uh, pages of this booklet putting in different places etc that was something completely understandable now so there were no digital records of fully global for airlines, uh, for airlines uh, mobility, for instance. And you can you know, name the kind of data that now we digitalize. And then there are many, many other things. First of all, you know, we started with the web and all the participatory platforms that we have now. Well, what participatory platform you can imagine? All the things where we are required to do what we call citizen science, uh, uh, crowdsourcing, etc., etc. So these are what we call active data gathering. So you can do experiments, uh, you involve people, uh, even this basically the social, uh, you know, the social pattern experiment. You 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 call people to to work with you. And then there is what we call passive data collection. So the fact that actually we all produce tons of digital signals with your mobile phone, your internet uh, uh, traces, uh, your social networks, etc., etc., And we can harvest those data in a way that is completely independent from the subject in a sense, okay? And so we have this huge amount of data that finally we can, uh, we can harvest. And this has triggered a wave of what we call the inductivist approach. And now, why inductivist? Because this is basically is the classic uh, uh, thing that started uh, probably, you, some of you should remember, uh, about 10 years now, probably, yeah, about 10 years ago, there was an article that was very influential. It was called The End of Theory, okay? It was published on Wired, you know, and the idea was, okay, we don't need theory anymore. We just get all this data, put in a black box. And what is this black box? This is an algorithmic black box. That could be a very smart machine learning thing. Or it could be, if you want to do, let's do the, the simplest things. You can just do the, you know, the time series analysis. And then you, know, you can predict the future. You don't need to understand things. You don't even say we don't need science anymore. Yeah, we don't, don't need even. 
programmers. Yeah. So basically, you need just uh, yeah, you need programmers. You know, because this is what you have to do to have a pipeline that uh, you know put your data in and that's it. But why I call this inductivist approach? Because this approach is inductive in the sense that uh, it's based on one approximation, on, on, on one big, uh, big idea. The fact that if you have a time series, essentially, you know, you know that the dynamical system, sooner or later, will go through the same states. And so if you have enough uh, history of the system, you can predict the next time of the, of the system by looking at the past. Okay, and this means uh, is what is called uh, in basic principle the theory of analog. Okay, you find the na analog points in the past. When you do statistically, when you use very complicated regressions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you are just making this statistical in the sense that you count uh, millions of patterns, you don't know exactly what it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, this is based uh, on uh, on. Uh, and other things, that is this idea that the dynamical state has recurring patterns. And this is true. We know that. However, there is something that is very, very uh, slippery. is the fact that there is a theorem that is called the recurrence Poincaré theorem. So this recurrency of points takes, can take millions of years. So it, you might need really a very, very long history of the system before this can be correct. And so we, 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 you might wonder why they in general work. Well, in general works because you are doing a, reductional, uh, a reduction of the dimensions of the systems. And if you do enough reduction, you get quite a predictive power. And then obviously this is also what machine learning does in a smart way when it's supervised, et cetera, et cetera. You find the features that characterize the system, and then you do this kind of, uh, of analysis. Well, this is at the basis is what, for instance, was a great, was, was a great idea. Google flu trend. Do you, do you know what is Google flu trend? So you can look at people searching for the uh, words related to flu on Google. Then you create a time series of, these, uh, of, these, uh, of the amount of searches uh, about flu. And you can correlate with the, with the flu season. And then you can start to do prediction in a much better way than waiting for the ground truth from the center of disease control or any other monitoring system. Well, these things was indeed working and not working for many, many reasons. That, and I will tell you a little bit more. And the other thing is that, you, for instance, you can use uh, other signals like Twitter and do the same stuff. However, you start immediately to see that this is a subtle approach. For instance, if you look at uh, the searches on Twitter, uh, the, 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 the tweets mentioning uh, flu, and then you correlate with the seasonal flu, you get a very good correlation. But then you harvest uh, all the uh, words uh, and hashtags related to zombies, and then you get a better correlation with the flu. So why is that? Do you have any guess? Yes, exactly. <laughs> because The Walking Dead is a, is a series that goes exactly in the same months of the flu season generally, and so there is a very good correlation with it. So this is a very nice article by Marcel Salaté and co-workers. And you know, you have these kind of issues. And with Google, actually, the things was even deeper. And was the fact that when you have a black box, like you know, you pipeline data and then you bring it in, you need to consider that you know, actually, the algorithm themselves changes. Google has changed in time. At a certain point, it switches a function that is the how to feel. So when you're doing a search, it starts suggesting you the terms that you should, should search. Well, what happens at that point? What happens is that it introduces a bias that if it's not discounted in the system that correlates with the flu, gets wrong results. And so Google Flu Trend was a breakthrough, and I'm not uh, telling anything uh, against it. But you know, you have to be careful about uh, pitfalls in this, in this uh, end of theory, end of theory uh, issue. And first of all is one, well, is, uh, uh, is this kind of the black box and changeable of algorithm, uh, uh, reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. And these are more structural things. Then there is a, one more stuff. Uh, yeah, Dirk. Yeah, in the meantime, was taken offline by Google, by the way. I'm sorry? Google was taken offline by Google. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's uh, what happened is that uh, Google flew trended a couple of missteps, uh, and then at a certain point, uh, uh, we do brought uh, some some stuff about it. Uh, they say that they corrected the stuff, and then they didn't. Uh, at the end, they took it offline. You know, so but this is not you know the Google flu trend is still uh, something that I, you know, I think is a huge idea showing a lot of potential, but you need to be aware of the pitfalls. And as I was saying, you know, there is the black box issue, but there is also one more thing. And this is a common uh, error. When you have this time series analysis, well, you want to train the system for as much as you can. And this is good, for instance, if you look at certain system that uh, evolves on uh, Geolo geological eras, but if you talk, for instance, about diseases and you want to use data on the flu or the measles in 1950s to train the system now, well, this doesn't work. Because in the 50s, the healthcare system was completely different. You know, all the approach to diseases and public health is different. So, you know, you have these kind of issues that are more intrinsic. Then there is all the issue about you know, the technical point of what does it mean to do reduction on mapping, etc., etc. And there is a, a, a recent article by Hosni and Burpiani on philosophy and technology. It sounds like a strange journal, but actually this is really a must read uh, if you are in big data. That tells you what are the technical complications of that. And you see, for this reason, why big data is great, uh, I want to get to a different, a slightly different definition of big data. That, uh, let's move from big data to new data. What, what I mean with that? But because, you know, it's not just a matter of how long is the time series, uh, how much data we have. And actually, if we are, especially in the context here, it's not a matter of uh, having a terabyte or petabyte of data. You know, it's, you know, this is not what we are handling. Even, uh, you know, entire, uh, uh, call uh, CDR of uh, mobile phones. It's, it's gigabyte. It's not really the big data as we are using uh, in other areas, you know, like in physics. When you talk about physics or astrophysics, big data is petabyte uh, per minute. You know, this is, this is not the big data in that sense. What is really different is in terms of new data is these are data which are, uh, the relative growth is impressive in the sense that we just didn't have cold data records five years ago. And now we can monitor millions of people at once in their mobility. This is the difference. It's not the fact of the amount of data. And these data are new and allow, finally, to get into a completely different approach that is, uh, you know, bring us out of the hype of uh, end of theory, but actually brings in the hype of uh, do more theory. These are finally the data that allow us to understand the system, to have the data, to have the theory. Because one of the big pitfalls of those approaches that we were showing before is this lack of data, actually. The fact that if when I do the forecast for a disease or I do the forecast for the, the weather, it's the same. The system is completely agnostic. It's a time series. It doesn't care, OK? So it's the same stuff. Well, what I want to know is what is the mechanism and what I have in the, actually, in the, in the processes underlying the system. This is what I want to understand, what the new data, big or small, can allow us to, to get. And this is very important, uh, you know, for in, uh, in, uh, in contagion processes, because we, we have that in contagion processes, you know, all the interactions and all the new data that, that we gather are really allowing us to finally establish this theory. So, let me go through a few examples. Uh, the first one is what we are doing here, the social pattern experiment. These are data, and uh, Ciro Cattudo will show all this data much, much better in the future. But these are is an experiment in schools in which you have face-to-face uh, -face interaction in different classes of a school. So you can measure the interaction within class, when they have recess, when they do activities together. And this is a very fine time resolution and with you know really discriminating if you are face to face or you are giving back to the people and all these will be 
you know, uh, uh, worked out in details by, by in the talk by Shiro Katu, they're pretty sure. But these are great data that actually are in the class of sensory data. So this is all the things, uh, you know, that uh, all the data that you get from all the sensors that we distribute in the environment now, or we can distribute. And now these kind of experiments cost, uh, you know, a fraction of, uh, of a dollar, in a sense, with respect to just 10 years ago when doing an experiment like uh, we are doing in this school with social pattern would have costed really a huge amount of money. And now this is really something that we can do on any, on any scale in a very easy way. Then there are data like this one that perhaps some of you have seen. And these are mobile phone traces in the city of Paris. So these are traces from a singular mobile phone and people moving across places in the city. And so you see that you can follow individuals, create these very detailed origin destination maps of people that actually uh, give you an idea of the mobility at this mesoscale level that you can match with the face-to-face -face interaction if you have the way to, to, to match mobility and, and get into this, uh, into this uh, very nice, uh, I would say, mobility vision that was completely unprecedented until, until 10 years ago. And then, you know, this is, for instance, the digitalization of, uh, of data. This is, you see, all flights in the US first, uh, they take off in the morning on the East Coast and then they go on the West Coast. Uh, the last one to, bar, uh, to, to light up is uh, Hawaii, and this is because of the time zone. Then you see all the flight coming from Europe here. So you know now, and, and for instance, in what we do with epidemics, we, uh, we get into this database uh, in real time. So basically, you can really harvest all those data about human mobility and context in a way that is unprecedented, and that finally allow the construction of these theoretical tools. So in a way, what we do now, is that we focus on these data sets and you know we try to extract the microscopic uh, rules of interaction uh, the, the the statistical patterns that we need to develop theory and this mechanistic approach and let me say something because this is initially is driven by a reductionist approach you need to understand the interaction among single how they go from place to place etc but then this is uh, a two-way ticket you go to the mechanistic description to the individuals, but then you have to aggregate millions of individuals, billions of individuals, and so you go back from the reductionism and you get in a classic situation where you are dealing with complex systems, and from this microscopic interaction, you need to understand the emergent pattern in the system. And so you see that this is something important. Another important uh, aspect to take into account is the fact that uh, don't think that developing a theory means that you have the theory of everything. You know, this is like for weather forecast. We learned this uh, hundreds of years, uh, hundred years ago. So for each level of description, you have generally to work out effective descriptions of the systems. You have to find the equation that better provide the approximation, integrate assumptions at that level for the question that you are asking. So it's a dynamic work that you are doing, step by step. And then, you know, these data, big data, small data, are finally the fundamental point for the initial conditions that we need to do forecast and analysis. Because this is what we need at the end. We need to know the state of the system to calculate the next uh, uh, the, state, the next state of the system at, uh, uh, in the future time. And so, you know, this new data, big or small, is now at the basis of this revolution, where actually theory, this is one of my main points here today, is at the center. And when I mean theory, I mean this. Because when we do this, it's because we have theory. When we do hurricane forecast, when we have these spaghetti models, it means that we have integrated equation, we have an understanding of the atmosphere, we have an understanding of the basic laws that describe the system, and we can do those analysis. Well, this is what we try to do, and this is the work that has lasted for more than 10 years at this point that I was telling. So we started to integrate this idea to create computational tools to do epidemic forecast, contagion processes forecast. And so we started to integrate data at the level of the population. You can get, for instance, wonderful maps of population, one by one kilometer resolution. Then you 
put overlay on these maps, you know, socioeconomic factors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you get all the mobility, airline companies, you get uh, uh, local mass transportation, commuting patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On top of these, you have to build the dynamics of the disease spreading. And this is, there is no model that fits all diseases. Each disease will have its, its own model with its own parameters coming from clinical data. And then, if you have the initial conditions, your hope is to integrate dynamically this equation and provide weather forecast, exact, uh, uh, epidemic forecast exactly like weather forecast. Okay? This is the dream. And we are working for that. It's not that I'm telling that now we have the same of, of, uh, of weather forecast. So what we do now is uh, to create a model architecture, and this is the, 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 first, uh, the first important thing, that is, you get inputs, you create uh, you know, a dynamical model that understands these mechanistic dynamics behind, uh, behind uh, the individuals, uh, and then integrates interpopulation and interpopulation mobility, dynamics, the transmission of the disease, etc., etc., with an output that at the end is the quantities of interest. So how many cases have been exported, how many cases you have in a place, so what we call the where, when, and how much of an epidemic. Well, <coughs> just give, let me give you an idea of the data. For instance, if you look in, uh, into, into New York, you see you have New York here, and then you look at all the international connections from New York. But then you have to go into the detailed uh, area of New York, and you see that there are commuting patterns across New Jersey, New Hampshire, New England, etc., etc. And you have to consider all these kind of mobility aspects, all these interaction, all these features of uh, of, of the system in a worldwide perspective. And then, within each of these areas, you have to model how people interact and how the disease is transmitted. And this can be done at different levels. One level is that you look at what we call chain binomial processes. You look at individuals that move from one place to another according to the mobility data that we have, and they carry the disease. But in a sense, we can imagine that they are homogeneously mixed in those subpopulations. Or you can start to integrate data like this one that will tell you what is the probability that at zero to five years old the individual is in contact with all the other age brackets in the population and so on and so forth. These are called contact matrices that tells you the frequency of interaction across age brackets. Or you can go into this very final uh, uh, level of resolution that is the construction of synthetic populations. And this means that you reconstruct uh, Household by household. So you assign individuals to an household. So there are, you know, the two parents, the two kids, and then there is two parents and one kid, and then the kids go to school together with the kids, uh, these other kids, and then there is another school for the where one of the individual parent is a teacher, and so on and so forth. This allows you to construct a very huge, and we are talking about millions of individuals, bipartite networks with individuals and uh, affiliation with the locations like households, school, workplaces. And then if you do the unipartite projection of this large structure, you get basically the contact pattern of the synthetic population. And you see that the colors of the interactions are different because in each different settings you different you have different uh, spreading properties for the disease. And so you create a, basically a synthetic world that is extremely detailed. Obviously, doing that uh, at the level of 7 billion individuals is a little out of our reach at the moment. And so generally what we do is that we use more approximate uh, uh, higher level representation like this one or this one, and then we use in specific area those representation when we need uh, to really zoom, uh, zoom in. And so what we do with that? Well, what we do is that, uh, and, 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 and Actually, what, what we do, we, we will see what we do. Let, let me say, first of all, what is the techniques and all the, the machinery that we have to build to, to, to solve those models? Well, this is a machinery that actually comes uh, from uh, what we call reaction diffusion processes on network. Because at the end, this is what we are doing. Peoples are live particles diffusing on a network. This network, however, is the real world. 
the data for the diffusion are the data for the real mobility. And then in the interaction of individuals, uh, there is the progression and transmission of the disease. There is the contagion process. And this is uh, mathematically is a reaction diffusion process for which we have two main points to consider. First of all, is stochasticity. Our systems are always stochastic in the descriptions because in the description because we cannot uh, take into account all the possible factors and there is always stochasticity. The second thing is that we need to preserve uh, the fact that we have discrete individuals. So in many cases, uh, don't be fooled, you will find uh, continuum description. Continuum descriptions are very, very dangerous because actually you start to describe individuals like fractions and that creates, uh, creates problems. So this framework is used and then at the end is at the basis of many of uh, the uh, visualization and things that you, that you find, in which you have at the end a way to uh, convey the message about the disease in maps that will give you the color, the number of infected, how people have traveled, etc., etc. Please remind one thing, keep in mind one thing. This is, those maps are in a cognitive way more intuitive. We understand location, places, diseases, etc. But actually, the way the algorithm reasons is this way. So it's a very abstract way in which you have networks, you have nodes, and you have you know, individuals traveling through these nodes. So it's a much more abstract uh, way that only at the end we map back into the, into the space. And this is one of the examples of what you can do. This is for the people that, who live in London. You know, this is a highly pathogenic disease spreading from London. And then you can really look at the trace of each single individual, how they went through across the world on single flights, seeing the epidemics in other places of the world. And you see that this is uh, give you an idea of what you can do with a single realization of those, uh, of those uh, 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 numerical approaches. Now. Obviously, one realization doesn't tell you anything about reality, because reality might uh, be one of the many, many realizations that you have here. And so what you have to do is that, and this is one of the barriers in the numerical computation of these models, is that you have to repeat millions of times what you are doing and try to, and try to, uh, to extract the statistical patterns that generally describe an epidemic of that kind with the, those initial conditions. And so this is uh, one of the things that you don't need just to do one realization, but you have really the problem of facing uh, the multiple realization. Just to give you a, a, an idea, this is work that we did in 2009 for the H1N1 pandemic. I don't tell you how we uh, initialize the model because I will show you a little later. But let me tell you what are, because you might think, okay, you are creating a kind of big uh, SimCity game. No, you want to know that actually this is not SimCity, that you are predicting uh, real stuff. And so this is the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, and this is what we did with, uh, uh, with our model, actually during the summer, to predict all the peaks uh, of the epidemics in, uh, in, uh, in the northern hemisphere in the winter. And uh, you see that this is, uh, this is obviously the 95 uh, confidence interval. You see that all the peaks in the northern hemisphere are, are around October, end of October, early November, in most of the places. You would say, okay, this is what is special about that. Well, actually, there is a special about that because generally all the models for flu uh, strains have a seasonal driver. So the more it's cold and the more the transmissibility high. And this uh, peak generally is uh, January to February, in some cases even March. And so this is in the model. But actually, because of the initial condition, the mobility, the specificity of the H1N1 pandemic, you see that the peak is several months before, so at the beginning of the season. And that very, was very, I would say, not easy to understand if you don't consider all the feature of, uh, of the and complexity of this spreading. And actually, here you see the final data. So these are the red, the, the red bar is the data from the monitoring uh, uh, and surveillance infrastructure. So you see that in most of the cases, you see the, the, uh, the actual peak of the epidemic was uh, spot on with the, with the forecast. And just tell you, okay, the model can give you insight, can tell you, look, 
For a pandemic with those conditions, although you would expect the big wave to be in January, February, as usual, is not like that. It will be earlier. And that allows you to alert the system, to tell, to tell hospitals you know, when they have to expect the maximum number of patients, and so on and so forth. Other things is like what happened in the West Africa uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014, in which you can use the model to monitor the different uh, stage of the disease. You see that the, the, the dots are the actual experimental data. This is for the full epidemic, basically. And these were different models at different times that were assuming the status quo, what we call the early exponential growth, the marginal containment and containment. All this is work that is done in real time. So it was done during the unfolding of the epidemics. And there are a lot of numerical, uh, numerical issues. So just let me show you an example. How, how much I have more? Just give me the time. Half an hour or something? Or oh. So we finish at 11, and then we have time for questions. OK, so again, lax, because it was, uh, yeah. OK, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> OK, like 40, so 40 minutes, wow, half an, minutes. an hour is a lot, but we have a lot to discuss. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so you see, and people start to flee. <laughs> no, more, half an hour more, no. So you see what happens. Uh, this is, uh, when you do something like that, uh, the big problem uh, when, when you have, you know, these things that I told you so far this story. It seems, uh, okay, well, you have the data, you have the things, you, you get the uh, clinical disease uh, information, you run the model. Fortunately, it's not that simple. And the non-simple part is the fact that actually you know very little at the beginning about the disease itself. You don't know some of the characteristic parameters, like the transmissibility, many things. Uh, some stuff comes in during the first uh, couple of months, like uh, what we call generally the incubation time. Yeah. Okay, so 20, 20, 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, good. Well, now, really, okay. So the big problem is how we do the calibration. So how we find the parameters that describe better the disease. And this is done through techniques like Monte Carlo like root analysis, MCMC, that are quite computationally expensive and this is one of the big issues because basically what you do is that you start to sample the entire phase space of the possible parameters running millions and millions of simulation and try to match a subset of the simulations that best represent the real data that you have up to that point and then you say okay those are the correct parameters more or less and then we start to use those parameters to project in the future so you know this exercise is really computationally time consuming and so let me show an example of what is done uh, generally and then I'll show you for something that is very simple is the seasonal flu simple in the sense that all of you know about the seasonal flu. This is work done also with Nicola. We have done for many years that, because we have done that during the CDC forecast influ influenza forecast challenge, that every year the CDC asks a group of modelers, uh, several group of modelers to do forecast for the seasonal flu. And you would say, OK, seasonal flu, we all know about it. Okay. Well, it should be the best known disease, etc., etc. Well, unfortunately, it's one of the most uh, difficult uh, to model. And basically, for one reason, when you have a pandemic, an emerging health threat, generally you have a little bit of knowledge about the initial conditions. Ebola is, was in West Africa, you have the initial cases there, you have the H1N1 pandemic, it started in Mexico, and so on and so forth. The flu is all over the places. He's always with us. In the summer, it's very low or zero activity. But then, you know, there are several co-circulating things. So how you do forecast? Indeed, if you look at uh, different seasons, you see that they are very different. These two have a very pronounced peak. Some others are almost never above the threshold line. The dotted line is the threshold above which uh, you say there is flu activity. And so how we can do prediction of that? And this is the problem. And one of the problem is the initial condition, how we establish the initial condition of the model, and how we calibrate the model for with the right parameters. And this is 
what we defined is, a, is basically is a, a pipeline to make automatic prediction on the flow that uses now social data along with all the data that we use uh, for, uh, uh, for creating the model, social data that we ingest in the model so to obtain the initial condition. So what we do is that we use the CDC ground truth, the monitoring surveillance that is telling uh, two weeks before that was the activity because the CDC has a one to two weeks lag uh, behind, uh, you know, you have to collect the data, go to the doctor, etc. So the data of today are basically the data of two weeks ago. And then we use Twitter data in a way that I will show you in a few, in a couple of seconds. Then we have our modeling, we do the calibration and then we do forecast. How this uh, work out? Well, what we want to know initially is what is the prevalence of the flu in different areas of, uh, for instance, United States or Italy or the Netherlands or wherever. So we need to have a geolocalized view of what is the flu activity. How we can do that? Well, one of the things that we decided to use, one of the things that could be uh, alternative things, for instance, is the Twitter signal. You can collect all the tweets with words related to, uh, to flu. And actually, this is the top 10 correlating word. It's medic, flu, unwell, ill, virus, muscles, uh, cough, uh, headache, etc., etc. And why we use Twitter? Because Twitter is geolocalized. Although the geolocalization is not that much, it's just about 2%. And if you do some more interesting things, you can do up to 30, 40% of geolocalization. Well, you know, you get a good proxy of what is the level of discussion about the flu in different regions of the United States. Well, this is not the number of people with the flu. You understand that there is no correlation with that but it's a proxy of the relative activity of the flu there will be places in which there is a lot of discussion and that means that they have much more flu than other places Washington than Los Angeles and so on and so forth why uh, Twitter is because Twitter is stable uh, the usage pattern in the US uh, are stable etc etc don't let me not go into these things and then what you do to define the initial conditions uh, is to create basically something that is a convoluted function of the number of tweets, the penetration of Twitter in each region, because you have to discount the fact that in some places you have more Twitter users than others. Uh, you weight each uh, uh, word or hashtags according to a certain correlation coefficient, because some flu has a much higher correlation coefficient than headache, <laughs> and so on and so forth. All that, however, is modulated by a parameter that is completely free. That is what is telling you what is the relation between this signal and the number of flu cases. And this is not determined, okay? This is not determined together with other parameters that actually describe the flu strain, like the transmissibility, the time, uh, the infectious time, um, the proportion of vaccinated or individual with residual immunity and so on and so forth. This model has many parameters and then what you do is that you run the model in an hyperdimensional cube like this one in which there are different parameters including that parameters why that rescaled the, the, the Twitter signal and then you generate millions of stochastic curves of stochastic models which are basically tell you what could be the epidemic in those different uh, points of the phase space. And then what you get is, uh, what you do is that you take the ground truth that you have up to that moment, and then you apply a model selection, and there could be many other model selection approach that tells you which curves are better fitting those ground truth until that moment. These models can be different, can have more parameters than others, can be uh, initialized in a different way. You can, you know, in a sense you can enlarge that hyperdimensional cube in very, very different ways. And that's the reason why you have to use generally more, uh, um, uh, how to say, model selection which are a, a little bit more refined than the usual uh, fitting techniques, like for instance information criterion and so on and so forth. 
But then what you have is that automatically the selected model will give you, you know, what happens to the disease in the future. And will give you a window, basically, of possibilities that also defines an error on your predictions. But this is not just for the next time uh, point, so for the next week or the next day or whatever the system is predicting, but actually for the flu, for the flu, entire flu season. And this is because you are in plugging into the model not just a time series analysis. You are plugging the mechanistic process. So the model has the full behavior of, of, the, uh, of the flu. Uh, let me tell you just passing by that when you create a pipeline like that, there are a lot of uh, system architecture issues that you have to solve. Here you have also to have uh, big data because, for instance, the Twitter database starts to be a terabyte of data that you have to mine in real time, etc., etc. And this is, for instance, on the results from the 2012-2013 campaign. You see that obviously you start, uh, these are the predictions. So you see this is the uh, peak intensity, this is the peak time. And you see that initially the prediction have a large confidence interval. You are working with uh, little knowledge of the season, few points for the ground truth. And the more you get to the real value, so for instance, the peak week, because this is the, the different week of the, of the year, and your uh, error shrinks and your results get better and better. Okay, and that's for many, many quantities. For some quantities, you have problems. For instance, like the season length. The season length means that, you know, at the very beginning of the season, you have to do prediction for the end of the season. And this is really means that you are predicting, uh, you know, 20, 30 weeks in advance. So this is something that can be uh, quite, uh, quite complex. And so, the power of this model is that, you know, this next point, the peak time, can be given also by time series analysis and other more black box algorithm, what we call, uh, you know, not dynamical or mechanistic models. But the mechanistic models give you this information. And this information is crucial. For instance, the reproductive number of the disease, how much is transmissible in the population, the infectious time, the immunity in the population. You see that for each year, you get different values you get information on the strain. In the 14th, 15th season, the reproductive number was 1.8. In the 15th, 16th was 1.3. And then you get in different, you know, different residual immunity, different average infectious time. Well, this is very, very, very important. It's tell you about the characteristic, epidemiological characteristic of the disease. And this means that you gain an understanding of the process behind just the next uh, uh, point in the time series. And this is, uh, uh, it's very important because it's telling you that if you have theory, if you have understanding, uh, you can get a much better results uh, for, for what is your, uh, well, your general understanding. Well, <coughs> actually, I've shown you the data with Twitter, but for instance, you can do with InfluenzaNet, that is a participatory uh, web uh, uh, surveillance system in which people declare they f their flu symptoms. Uh, and you can do for all countries for which you can gather data from the uh, surveillance, uh, regular surveillance systems or participatory platforms, social media, etc. Uh, this is, for instance, is what we did for Italy. You see all the predictions uh, and, uh, and the actual data and so on and so forth for many other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is basically opens uh, uh, a way to do automatic predictions that whoever are based on our microscopic mechanistic understanding of the disease. Well, we don't know a lot. So let me say, however, that when we start, start to talk about uh, prediction, there is still a lot that we need to understand. First of all, what is the role of stochasticity? For instance, you see this is a cone of stochastic realization, and you see that a single realization can be you know, very much fluctuating. Uh, and in a sense, uh, what is out there in the reality? Is something that is typical, is something that is not typical? How we really do the better fitting uh, for those models? Uh, complex versus effective schemes. So you can introduce so much uh, uh, details in the modeling. What is better? What, what is the level at which you have to stop, including uh, 
uh, details uh, in order to get good predictions. What are the most relevant variables? What is the effect of data quality? This is all very, very, very complex and is work in progress. This is at the forefront. One thing that we have done, for instance, is to create at a certain point a synthetic Ebola challenge. We did, uh, with a huge HM-based model, created a fake uh, Ebola epidemic in West Africa that was realistic but was not the same as what occurred in 2014. And then, together with three government agencies and eight modeling teams across the world, we have made basically an exercise in which everybody was doing real-time prediction like if we were in a real situation, like a drill. Okay. Well, what happens is that you, can, you, you get a lot, a lot of understanding and one thing is that uh, there is no model that is better than anything else. Uh, you see this is the cone of uncertainty. Some models were performing very well, some other bad, but you know all models get uh, what we say a bad moment more or less and what you get is that really operationally it's very important to use super ensemble forecast. This is the way forward. You don't want one model. You want a portfolio of models and do super ensemble uh, by easy and average or whatever approach because these absorb the shocks that each single model could have at a certain point because of the underlying assumptions. The last five minutes. Yeah? Yeah, next. Hmm? Model, models is more than forecast and this is important you know this is important in this context because if we just talk about forecast we get into trouble we end up into troubles we need to think of the model for all the other things that the model can give you when you have a theory when you understand it situational awareness intervention planning projection and then structure reasoning what is structure reasoning is counter counterfactual experiments for instance, I could have a model and say, okay, it's better that I build hospitals or that I do uh, awareness campaign in the population. You cannot do that in, uh, in policy making unless you have those counterfactual models that will tell you what is best to do. Well, let me give you an example in these three minutes. Zika, who knows about Zika? Okay, Zika is a vector-borne disease. This is a completely different story. The mosquitoes are in the loop. Okay, however still, yeah, and mosquitoes doesn't, doesn't have a, a mobile phone, so that's a big problem, you know. Because, uh, luckily enough, they don't move, so they do 500 meters. So all the mosquitoes that you see in this area will stay here, you know, okay. Now, what we do when we have such a model? Well, obviously the driver for Zika is, is us, because again, you have to be infected, go in a place, a mosquito will bite you, gets infected, and then bites somebody else. So the disease spreads because we go around. But the mosquitoes are crucial. And the, what keeps mosquitoes alive is the temperature. And so the weather is crucial. And so you have to integrate more data than I, I, I've shown you before. But what is the problem with Zika? Is that Zika emerged as a phenomenon in 2016 because we started to see microcephaly, that is a congenital neurodisorder of babies, in Brazil in 2016. But Zika was spreading in the population since uh, common wisdom, uh, the World Cup in Brazil, 2014. And so there are two years with no data. There is no way that you can understand anything in those two years. Well, with the modeling, you can do that. You can start to add all those things. There are beautiful maps of mosquitoes, you know? Mosquito, one by one kilometer maps of mosquito abundance. You know, tanks entomologists, they go every day to pick up female mosquitoes into traps. It's uh, an unbelievable work that the weather has to be, how to say, aggregated and, uh, uh, how to say, at the end you have a huge machine learning team uh, that will get those traps data and transform into those maps. And so you see, that again, computing is important. Uh, even the algorithm uh, and the black box are important. But those wonderful maps, uh, together with the wonderful maps of temperature, together with all the things that I, I've shown you before, like this, give you basically a model, including also socioeconomic factor, because if you have air conditioning, you are not exposed to mosquitoes. And that's also crucial. Give you, finally, a model that has all the equation where you can 
evaluate what, uh, what is the evolution of Zika. Now the problem is that you don't know anything in those two years. You don't know what happens in 2014, 2013. And so what you do is what we have done with the flu, basically. You try to start all the possible initial condition. Since 2013, you create simulation of Zika that gets introduced in Brazil at a certain point in one city, in one of the many possible cities of Brazil, what we call the urban cycle. Well, then you do basically calibration and Bayesian analysis on the evidence that is evidence in 2016, actually, and you get the posterior distribution, for instance, for the time of introduction of Zika and the place of introduction. Well, this distribution, again, it's very surprising. It's 2013, October, November, December 2013. It's not the World Cup. It's much earlier, and even much earlier than thought. And so you would say, is that true or not? Well, then you do phylogenetic. You go around and collect specimen of Zika. You do phylogenetic analysis. And the phylogenetic analysis tells you that is exactly that time window, end of 2013. And so you can validate the two approaches and get a picture of something that is not accessible because there are no data there. There is no other way than modeling and mechanistic dynamic modeling to get what happened and when Zika has been introduced because you don't have the data. So obviously with the model then you can start to do all the situational awareness, how many cases I expect, how many microcephaly, I don't want to go there. But also you get things like this one. You can, you know, you have the full dynamic behavior along the many years of the epidemics, and you can say when is declining, when to when the epidemics will probably fade out. That actually was in 2017, has been corroborated now. And also do work like we are doing for the NIH in selecting the spots where to expect the residual activity, so to do tests for the vaccine trials. So you see that this is things that only dynamic modeling can give you. And so I close here with my usual provocation now. You know, modeling is important and theory and understanding, not despite the lack of data, but exactly because of the lack of data. Because this is our way, the modeling, the understanding, to get, to fill those gaps that otherwise we could not be able to fill if we just have, you know, black box or other kind of approaches. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful talk. By the way, this Zika work, uh, <coughs> have a look at the paper, the PNIS, because it's unbelievable, really. I'm biased, but Thank really. <laughs> and I, uh, so, Thank we have you. some time for some questions. Uh, please use the microphone. David, can you go around the microphone if any question, comments? The microphone is there. And don't be shy. Yeah, so come on. Come on. Even if you say that's I don't believe anything. Louder. You know, louder. Well, one second. Get no, the microphone yes. because otherwise in the back they don't. Uh, yeah. Can, uh, can we just get it? There is one here, here one here, one and then one there. Oh. How much in advance do you think it's uh, possible like, to predict re reliably uh, this uh, dynamics? Move a bit. Yes. Yes. Because for weather frogs, it's like five days, I guess. And also, like how uh, discuss a bit more how can you discuss a bit more how uh, increasing the complexity, like describing at the level of a household, uh, really uh, enhance the predictive power, or rather? Uh -huh. uh, okay, no? these are very. The, the question was, uh, what is the basically the predictability limits uh, that we have with those approaches and how the complexity scales these predictability limits, what is the effect of considering uh, uh, detail agent-based model, etc. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> and the, the question is the following. For the weather, we know that now is about 10 days, basically. The, window, the, the reliable windows is five days, one week, 10, 15 days. You can push up to three weeks, four weeks, but it start to be very fuzzy. For us, uh, we don't have the problems of uh, many nonlinear systems, so the, uh, this is an absorbing system, uh, the, I would say the, the divergence of the upper of the, the dynamical system, uh, divergence, etc., is less uh, critical. 
What is uh, uh, critical, however, is our knowledge of initial condition. Whatever epidemics, any reporting, any data is noisy, and there is quite a lot of noise. This is a lot of work that we're doing. What is the, 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 the time window? Well, I can tell you, for the flu now, basically we have a time window of four weeks. And then for the peak and other more, uh, I would say, uh, descriptive features, you can get up to six, eight weeks. For other, I would say that depend. one major issue down, down the road is that uh, for epidemics, there is social and behavioral adaptation. So what is the point is that if I have a hurricane, the hurricane doesn't care about my, my prediction. If I have prediction of Ebola that are devastating in West Africa, well, you know that people will start to be aware to the disease, uh, we will start to do intervention, and so things change. So this is another part of the game, how we monitor and how we include the intervention into the, into the modeling. And this, depending on what kind of intervention, changes basically the horizon of your prediction accordingly. For instance, why for the H1N1 we were able to do long-term prediction is because after the first couple of months, everybody was not worried anymore about the H1N1 pandemic. It was a mild, uh, it was a mild, it was a flu, but nothing dramatic, uh, and so it was not the 1918 pandemic. And so, you know, people didn't change their behavior. About the agent based model, this is, uh, again, I told you about this competition with the synthetic Ebola challenge. Coarse grain model was performing were performing better than uh, than engine based model generally, but they do not access information, so they were not able to get into the geographical spread. To do that, you need to have engine based models because otherwise the coarse grain model start to, to to not provide you the right. So I think uh, it depends on the question you are asking to the model. It depends the, uh, then the resolution that you have to use. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So I was wondering whether you can talk a bit more about interventions, so whether you have done any work on about, sorry? interventions. Oh, yeah. Um, and also I was wondering what's kind of, I mean, just thinking about the vision of all this work, what do you think would be kind of the next type of data that will come out, like in terms of sensor data or whatever, that will give us new possibilities to kind of study this social phenomena? So maybe you could share a bit your vision of where this is going yeah. in the next. Uh, okay, so the the work, the first question was the uh, interventions. So, so the intervention is uh, is a lot uh, where we get into the counterfactual things. And so I can give you an example. During the Ebola epidemics, uh, there was issues. At a certain point, the epidemics was spiraling out of control. You have to decide. You have finite resources generally. And you have to decide, I will build the Ebola treatment unit, so I will send people to do safe burial of people and, and, and get, you know, uh, dead bodies properly treated, etc., etc. Well, you can do experiments uh, numerically to see what is the best effective combination of things. Now, I always tell policymakers, a model is not the reality. So the policy uh, making should read the model as quantitative uh, extra intelligence, but it's not something that you have to take verbatim, you know. It's, uh, it gives you an idea where, where to go. The other thing is that, for instance, for Zika, what you do is to do things like, okay, let me understand what would be the activity, there is the vaccine trials, and uh, can we understand if spraying against mosquitoes has, uh, has uh, effect or not? And this is, goes beyond, as I was saying, forecast. The intervention is mostly the modeling exercise in which you try to include the feature of the intervention into the model and see what happens. It's the most difficult part, because in many cases, the policy making makers are envisioning uh, interventions that have never been used in that context. And so you don't have data also on the intervention. They will tell you, we will spray against mosquitoes on, in this region. And then you ask them, okay, do you have data of mosquito reduction after spraying? And they will tell you generally no. And so you have to start to do a lot of sensitivity analysis. This is what you do with the models. So what is the reduction of mosquito is 50%? What if the reduction of mosquito is uh, 20%? And so on and so forth. And so this is, this is the work. The future. The future is, I think, we are just scratching the surface. Uh, 
I talk about participatory platform and things like that. Well, I strongly believe uh, that in a few years we will all have uh, a watch uh, which will take our blood sample and things like that in, in a short time. At least it will measure our temperature. So I expect that we will have data about you know people with fever in real time from, from, from most of the population. You can integrate data about uh, clinical record, now there is more and more clinical records that are becoming available in real time, interlinked, etc, etc. So we will have access to unprecedented data that we can, we can use in real time. And uh, I have this, this I, I, I don't want to be too optimistic or too much of a dreamer, but so far we are talking about epidemic prediction about uh, the population, at the population level. I expect we will be able to do epidemic prediction for the single individual. So what will be your probability of being infected in the next 10 days? Based on your social relation, the place where you live, uh, the data that comes from, uh, from your, uh, from your uh, watch and, uh, and uh, devices, etc. So that opens a huge amount of uh, ethical and privacy problems and issues because how you pull, give this data to the single individual, so you're going to have the flu uh, in the next 15 days, immediately is also telling that your friends have the flu and that you know that uh, you are risking and you don't want to stimulate reaction like, okay, now I close myself in my apartment, you know, things like that, you, you can imagine. And for other disease could be even more delicate. So, but I think that, you know, we will have so much pervasive data that things uh, like, you know, a personalized prediction will be will be possible. Probably, I, I always say it's 10, 15 years, and I'm always, you know, see that this time gets shorter. So, there are two questions. Please. Do you see a connection to classic or dynamic systems theory, like counting the you know, exponents, chaos, and, and those things? I mean, um, in these models, you don't really know the entire universe. We don't you don't really have questions of motion, of course. And uh, what you are doing is uh, have various uh, Monte Carlo simulations changing a bit initial conditions, right? So this is kind of what it is. Right? And some models have uh, now use those equations, climate, where it's also kind of interesting. But do you see more of a goal they, to like, quantify these things? Yeah. This is something that uh, should be quantified more. It has been already quantified uh, quite a lot, in a sense, because uh, all the uh, mathematical epidemiology for 200 and, and more years has been based on differential equation and, and dynamical system theory. So there is a lot of theory about simple SIR model, SIRS, et cetera, et cetera, where there are all those things worked out. So we know that, that part. The problem is that when you do the real stuff, you know, you start to have stochasticity, you have to have this issue introduced by the discrete nature of individuals, et cetera, et cetera, that change things because now you have stochastic uh, uh, equations, uh, you have chain binomial processes and things that are a little bit more difficult to understand analytically, especially to work out. So there is a lot of work to do. There is much more that should be done, especially because most of the work has been done for simple models and now we are talking about things which are, which are huge. So that's certainly yes. There is a lot of work to do to do on the calibration and the initial conditions. I'm telling you Oh, we do this laden uh, hypercube uh, sampling, etc. If you are a person that knows about that, uh, knows also that those are very, very uh, rough uh, calibration because you have that the space of the uh, hypercube is important, etc. One should do MCMC simulation in which basically you do, uh, you know, a metropolis algorithm in the space space of the model and get all the things. And these are very computationally demanding. I think there is a lot of future for supercomputing. So on one side, there is a lot of theory in dynamical system for these models, a lot of theory on how to uh, integrate those equations properly with supercomputing and how to do the calibration. And so there is a lot of things to do that. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very, I think, active, active field if you are in that uh, line of research about the, the technicalities of, of the methodology. 
there is a lot of work to do also in terms of validating any kind of external data source uh, the, the getting new data and data source into those streams and what is their effect and so there is really a lot and then there is all the clinical part another thing that is very important in gets all the phylogenetic analysis I was shown before and integrating those models and now phylogenetic is done in real time and you know, sooner or later, phylogenetic will get it even in social sciences a lot. So this is something that uh, we, we need to be ready. It will be another revolution. This is, uh, with Zika, is one of the first time that basically was almost real time phylogenetic uh, uh, analysis. For Ebola, it, the full phylogenetic things is uh, one year later. For Zika, it's basically now, and the things are still going on, and it will be more and more into real time. Maybe the last question? If any pressing matters, yes, please. No, Not really pressing, but... <laughs> uh, no, I have so many questions, so many things that I would like to, to comment on, but we don't have the time. And, uh, well, we have also one week here, so yeah, we can so talk a lot, you know. Really about, you know. Really, it was yeah. like, for me, it was really an impressive talk. And, um, Thank you very much. I come from social sciences, so there were many things that... Um, well, you were you were optimistic to get all this data, and I was like, really? Is it so soon that we're going to get all of this data, and they're going to be so individualized? So I kind of said, as a scientist, it's um, really intriguing for you to be more accurate, and accurate on the modeling and all these algorithms and models that you produce. And uh, I guess it's also important for the population to be able to detect an epi uh, epidemia beforehand so we can have um, certain groups and uh, societies. On the other hand, you said yourself that you said to policy makers that this is just, it's not an absolute truth and it's just uh, a guide. Uh, but the truth is that policy makers do not listen to this kind of advices and they, many times they predict and they are basing their uh, policy making decisions based on these predictions. So what is the responsibility of the researcher on the societal implications and concerns that raise with these individualized and uh, other predictions? That's, uh, that's a wonderful question and a question that, yeah, you could take uh, an entire morning to, to develop in a sense, because the first thing is how you use these models in a, in a decision room. And that's, uh, that's a very difficult exercise. Let me say that, obviously, uh, it took several years to get those models into a decision room. Because initially, there is a lot of skeptical uh, uh, attitude toward them. And initially, the people say, OK, but this is a numerical exercise. The more you have success stories, the more you start to, to show that the models works, provides information, although it's not complete, it's not exact, etc. And the more the the policymakers want to know about the model. Then the other, at that point, you have the classic, uh, you know, uh, rebound, and uh, you have to say, look, this is a model, so don't trust the model just for what it is, uh, don't take it face value, but try to look at the uh, approximation, etc. This comes, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, the appropriate approach is to develop a dialogue in which we more and more get into, into, into the same uh, room with the policy makers and start to develop, uh, to develop those, uh, uh, those understandings. And I think uh, this is what is happening in, uh, in epidemic modeling, uh, partly, where we had all these kind of recent uh, health threats and the modelers were involved and more and more. Some very bright uh, policy makers that started to make this connection happen uh, that are crucial. You have to identify the people who are the good ones where you can talk uh, with. And, uh, and the modelers too have to be very humble and understand that you can do your prediction, you can do your modeling, but what you are, you, you don't have the full story. And what is the full story? The full story is that there are political reasons, uh, public concern, why a best strategy could not be the politically best strategy. And, and you cannot be just a 
technocrats, you know, in which, okay, this is the best things and so I force uh, the, the, to do that. No, you know, and this is where you, you have this dialogue and I think both communities learn to, from each other and you get a, a, a balanced approach. Let me say that in epidemics obviously it seems uh, easier to do because you have obviously an health threats, you want to do intervention, you want to, you know, you are there for the good, etc. The story, I didn't say that, but the story on contagion is so similar to what you can get for social contagion, for habits, for political uh, choices, for many things. So all these approaches can be transferred. It's not in the geographical space, it will be in the social space, but you can transform those into that area. The models will be more complicated because the biological mechanism is relatively simple. The uh, social influence is more complicated. There are thresholds, and there are uh, uh, combined factors, etc. Et but we will get there. We, you know, sooner or later we get there. And that it will be even more dangerous, even more complicated how to handle this. So we need to be ready. So this is where I say that always, you need to develop from now this dialogue and uh, foster you know, the integration of uh, modeling uh, data into the policy making uh, curriculum in a sense and vice versa and create this community that is able to use in an ethical and, and good way this, this information. But it's difficult and there will be for sure sooner or later problems. All right, let's thank Alex again. Thank you.